Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. It's four o'clock. Um, let's give a minute or two and we will get started soon. All right, let's get started here. Thank you. Thank you and welcome to session three, 6E, uh, New Age, New Solutions, part two. My name is Vijay Varadarajan and I work with HNTB. I will be moderating this session today. Before we move on, let's take care of some basic housekeeping items. We have two great speakers today, one from Vijo and one from No Traffic. I will introduce each of them prior to their presentations. Each speaker will have approximately 20 minutes to present on their respective topics. At the end of the two presentations, we will move on to the question and answer section. We will approximately have 20 minutes for answering your questions. Meanwhile, please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A window. You will have two options, either you could, either you could um, do a Q&A window or you could do a chat window. Use the chat window to share your thoughts, share your ideas on the topic of discussion, and use your question and answer window to post questions to the panelists. Please note that your phones will be automatically muted during the presentation, so you cannot talk, uh, you cannot talk to the panelists during the presentation. If you do need to talk to the speakers, you, know, you will have their numbers after the, at the end of the presentation and you could reach out to them. So with that, why the topic, New Age, New Solutions Part 2? It's simple. We had New Age, New Solutions Part 1 last year. So we got to continue the trend. And I foresee continuing this trend over the next few years. We have three criteria for this section. For this section. Number one, the, uh, the presentation should be based on uh, the latest technology, latest transformational technology, and number two, it should be an innovative solution. And number three, the company should have been in the business within the last three years. Okay, so those are the three criteria we have used to select uh, the, the solutions that we want to be presented at this particular section. So with that, let's move on to um, the topics. But before we go on to the topics, you now I have two polls for you to get a general sense of what kind of audience we have on out there. So with that, let's do the first, let's post the first poll. If you could answer that, I would appreciate it. it you will have approximately 10 to 15 seconds. You know, just pick the answer and we'll go from there. Right. Let's go on to the second poll. Can we post the second question, please? Okay, before we go on, here's the results. There are a lot of designers here um, and there are a few planners here. So it's, it's good. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Let's go on to the second poll. All right, we, I think we have some technique. Oh, there you go. All 
All right, let's close the poll and see the results. Let's give a few seconds before the results come in. Um, 82% have heard of neither. 12% have heard of both. Okay. All right. That's great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. So with that, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's interesting how we, what kind of audience we have. Thank you for letting us know. Appreciate it. So with that, let's go on to the presentation, right? The first topic we will have Vijo go and present their solution that they have implemented recently uh, on, uh, you know, using their technology. And then we will go on to the second one from no traffic. So with that, James Eden is a solutions engineer with Vijo. He supports the creation of bespoke solutions for several public and privately owned organizations. He, is, he has been part of the Vijo's new traffic intelligence product development team, enabling more partners to make use of our exclusive, their exclusive connected vehicle data. And you know what, I'm going to do this at the end of this presentation, around 55, 57, I have two questions to pose you on the speakers, and I want to guess who the speaker is. So with that, James, take it over, please. Thank you very much, Vijay. Uh, just checking that you can hear me okay, and you can see my screen by the sounds of it. Yeah, thumbs up, good stuff. So. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, really, really appreciate being here in this conference today. Uh, obviously, as you can probably tell from my accent, uh, maybe a little bit distant from you guys at this moment, but that's the beauty of how, where we're working remotely, more remotely than ever before, that we can have conversations like this in a more ad hoc basis. So thank you for the introduction then, uh, VJ. Yes, my name is James Eaton. I'm a solutions engineer here at Wejo. So from that poll, it, det it determined that there are not too many people know, uh, know of Ouija or have heard of us before. So that's hopefully one thing that I can remedy today. Uh, so if I move on, I will start to take you through the presentation. So who are we ultimately? So we do is a connected vehicle uh, vendor, co connected vehicle data vendor, ultimately. We partner with global auto manufacturers to create mobility intelligence revolutionizing the way we live, work, and travel. So at the core of Wejo, we're dealing with a lot of uh, data, vast volumes of data that can show the movement and whereabouts of people using their vehicles on a daily basis. That's where part of the, the, the piece comes in for Wejo in terms of we do the right thing and we're, we are, one of our mottos really is, is data for good. So if I was to move on to that and, and to carry on talking through this, then our data is uniqueness and part of why we're in this innovation uh, session today is that our data is directly from connected vehicles themselves. There's no aftermarket device or anything of that nature to maintain uh, and, and, and view our data ultimately. If I were to press through, so what does that start to look like on a large scale? So we have data across the US of around uh, 10 million vehicles total. What does that look like in some tangible numbers ultimately? This is one in every 28 vehicles. We see 95% road coverage in the USA where we see at least one of our data points from one of our attributed vehicles uh, per road segment over the course of a given month. Our capture rate is every three seconds so we can provide a real granular view of uh, the, the roadway. So for a turn count ratios and, and work such of that nature, we really have that fine granular view. At our peak, we're seeing around 650,000 data points coming into our, our, um, our, our environment, our, 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 our cloud, cloud store. So ultimately, um, we store a hell of a lot of data, but we're going to start moving into now as to why this is relevant, why this may be of interest to a forum such as this. Ultimately, um, connected vehicle data has, has a few key factors that I would call out on this, this, uh, this slide here. One being the latency that I just talked about there. So we, we 
describe that our vehicles can provide a breadcrumb trail from A to B. So really, really key for that, that origin to destination study with providing the route for the vehicle as well. The other key factor in that is, is we have a latency of around uh, 30 seconds. That's data from vehicle to our customers or our partners, whoever may need it uh, in that very short space of time. So you can give insight really, really quickly from, from vehicle to customer. When we look in the top right hand corner of the screen here, this is talking about the volume of journeys that are tracked. I mentioned earlier on around 10 million vehicles. Uh, they're active all points, all times of the day when, when, when people are using them. On average, over a month, we see around 1.3 billion journeys total US captured in our data set. We look at the bottom uh, left hand corner here. We're talking about our accuracy now. So our accuracy is in terms of how precise is the data that comes from our vehicles to attribute to where the vehicle actually is. So we have an accuracy of around three meters. And this helps identify such use cases as, as parking spots that you can see in that image there, or even highway lanes. Um, so what you can see from that image there is all the endpoints of all the journeys that we've seen over the course of a week, a grocery store in, and in this example is in um, California. What we would see then is also the colorization is showing uh, the fuel type of that vehicle. So whether it's an EV, whether it's a hybrid, whether it's a gasoline vehicle, that kind of insight. And then the bottom right hand corner that you can see is something else that is uh, again, fundamentally different about um, connected vehicle data. <clears throat> so if you imagine a vehicle may have upwards of around 2000 sensors on it. Some of the sensors that Ouija has, uh, has access to, and I'll talk about a few more as we come through this presentation, has access to harsh braking, harsh acceleration data. Uh, so this is information to infer safety use cases, such as um, how often people speed in a given area, that sort of thing. So as to press on, and uh, just to carry on elaborating on, on the differences and why Ouija is this, uh, has this uh, innovation, a different, different offering from what you perhaps may have seen before. What we have here then is a comparison to a, a source like mobile data. Um, one thing that Ouija is often compared to, mobile data as a great uh, resource, a great way of providing insight of the movements of people from A to B. However, it does come with, at times, a lot of noise, as you can see from this image here represented on the on the left. With Weijo's data and the accuracy that I talked about there, it's much more attuned and attributed to the roadway itself. So as you can see here is connected vehicle data gives a cleaner view if your, your purpose is to understand uh, traffic in a given area. So we're often asked, um, what does this look like in terms of the real life, the real world picture? So I mentioned we have around 10 million vehicles. Um, we have um, one in every 28 vehicles across the US. But what we've got here then is a little bit of a tangible comparison to uh, a piece of work that we did with a customer on the, on the East Coast. So we did a project where it was uh, understanding um, the increase or decrease of users on the tollway after a construction project of putting a new on-ramp onto that tollway. What Weijo's data could show, and you could see the Weijo data volumes in the blue columns that you can see here on screen. And then that was compared then to the, 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 the toll count to the toll, um, toll booths um, along the roadway. And what's interesting here is yes, the volumes are vastly different because we have a percentage of probes out there. Um, but what you can see is even over uh, the, the Christmas period, our peaks and troughs form very much in line with um, the, the toll count data itself. So that's a little piece on that. Just to move on and get local, obviously the, the local interest uh, for, for this group here is Pennsylvania. Um, so um, this gives an idea of how many vehicles typically we see in Pennsylvania over a given, a given month. Uh, so you can see in state total around 548,000 vehicles active, which is around 12.4% penetration rate of the overall vehicles that are represented on the roadway in Pennsylvania. So that's that. What does that look like? What does this picture actually look like? What could it actually show you? So here is a, uh, uh, I'm sure you guys are more familiar as I mentioned earlier. Uh, I'm not quite from Pennsylvania myself, um, but you get the idea of this is a, a snapshot of an area that our data could represent. So this is using our movement data. This is where it's providing a breadcrumb trail of uh, um, the vehicle movement from A to B. 
So if we to press play on this, you'll start to see what kind of visualization that we can see in this data. Um, so this is over, uh, this is uh, one day um, that you can see here, uh, the 25th of August. And you can see there the colorization in the legend that I've got in the bottom right hand corner there. It shows the speed of the vehicles as well. So really interesting insight for um, implementing a new uh, piece of construction, a new roadway, etc. You can start to understand the behavior of traffic in a more holistic view, uh, also from the origin of where they may have come from as well. If I was to press on a moment, my slides would play with me, there we go, and we zoom in a little bit more and make it a little bit clearer, we're at the Walt Whitman Bridge Toll Plaza here, and you can start to see again where we do accuracy might come into play. Um, so you can see uh, individual vehicles slowing down at the toll plaza and then moving through afterwards. You can see the colorization changes as you come to the, to the uh, toll booth in the, in the, the centre section there. So in a little bit of a summary in this part of my presentation then, so connected vehicle data offers more. So it's more accuracy, more data attributes as I've touched upon, and I'll go into a little bit more detail shortly, more coverage and more availability in higher frequencies. So this gives you a further, further view of what is the representation of traffic in a given area. We to move on now and to move through to the, the solutions uh, part of um, this presentation. Apologies, there we go. So the solutions part of the presentation, we're going to talk about some of the things that we've done from partners and some of the uh, things that our data may enable. So when we first look at the, the lens of safety, ultimately, if we're looking at safety, then some of our attributes, as I mentioned, are data directly from the vehicles themselves. Um, this meaning that um, we can see over periods of time, harsh braking and harsh acceleration events. So these could be things that could infer uh, safety problems, uh, areas that mitigate the, that need mitigation of risk for an incident of those, that nature. We also receive autonomous braking. So autonomous braking, if you think about it, that's a little bit of a different braking event. A harsh braking event is where a, an individual has slammed their foot on the brake pedal, and that could infer that there was a near miss or an incident there. Autonomous braking, when that occurs, um, that's inferring that uh, the driver themselves may not be aware, may not be alert, and what gives a different layer of information ultimately in that. The next piece I'll talk about that is um, mentioned where there are many, many sensors available in these vehicles, but we have sensors that can detect air temperature and other weather conditions, so such as uh, the wiper status, such as the ambient air temperature, and a combination of those could infer uh, road condition. In, in connection with harsh braking and harsh acceleration, you can start to build a picture of areas that might need some, uh, some uh, a plow or um, grit, et cetera, to overcome any safety concerns that might be in that given area. The next piece that I've got there, next bullet point and jump off point is talking around queuing traffic. So obviously in the US, there's quite a bit of um, tailbacks where somebody has become slow and a lot of cars slam into the back of each other, unfortunately. But ultimately, with Wejo's data, if you take the combination of the, the, the near real-time data they may have mentioned earlier on, talked about the, uh, the speed in which that we can get it from vehicle to customer, we can start to identify areas that may be queuing traffic and inform local, local uh, enforcement, local uh, government, et cetera, to spot where this event is occurring. That could then be fed into the localized matrix signs to overcome any uh, safety issues in that way. So the, a good representation of what we can see there is in that, that image on the bottom right. Uh, the data points have come down to a slow, and then you've got the harsh braking event, which is that, that large red dot that you can see there. The next piece we're going to talk about in terms of a, a solution is talking around congestion. So we can support in congestion models using historic and near real-time data. So you can take our historic data that's backed up to around uh, May 2019, and compare that to the near real-time data to give you a prediction of how far away your model was. Uh, an example of that is in the top, uh, top right-hand image that you can see there. You can identify vehicle volumes uh, to support in traffic with our, support our traffic intelligence products. So we can say how many vehicles are in a given segment at a given time in a given day. Um, 
what mitigation needs to happen to reduce that congestion in that area? What can we design? What can we develop to, to ensure that that is, that is something that is mitigated? We can optimise traffic calming measures over time. Where is it that we see a lot of speeding events in a given area? We can provide information such as that. Understanding the effects of construction projects on a city and the statewide view. So we can provide information and support that we'd say the vehicle volumes are increased or decreased in a given area because people are avoiding a, con a construction project, for example. What does that mean? What is the new route? What is the new cow path for those, uh, those drivers? And the final one, this is, a, this is another interesting one, perhaps a slightly different angle when we talk around mileage based user fee. So we talked about it in terms of understanding vehicle miles traveled. So we have a true reflection of the movement of a vehicle from A to B. And in, in some instances, we can provide uh, the odometer reading of that vehicle at that time as well. What's interesting is you can see there from the top, uh, the graph on the top right, um, that is showing a trend line of our overall vehicle volumes in uh, across, uh, across uh, Pennsylvania before, during and after the current effects of traffic in this pandemic that we're in now. So you can see the high part of the graph there in early March. You can see the drop off the vehicle volumes as we move towards the end of March into April and the slow in, uh, increase again as we move towards July. So ultimately, I um, talked a lot about some of the things and some of the solutions there. Brought this slide up just to give a bit of an idea of something that uh, Darcy, uh, Darcy Bullock over at Purdue University used our data and has, has given a couple of sound bites here. Ultimately, they directly measures traffic performance in near real time, helps make decisions in minutes. The hard braking piece that I talked about allows you to see uh, problems much, much faster than trying to obtain crash data that can often be quite slow. Apologies on the chat there. Uh, one more slide from me, and then I'll be I'll be opening up for questions and handing back to uh, to VJ at this point. So, just to summarise, really, um, WeJo's position at the moment is is quite unique in the market that we are uh, the world's largest um, connected vehicle data vendor. Um, we take that data, we work with our OEM partners to do some um, management in the centre section that you can see here from our WeJo Adept platform provide consent management, standardize the data, make it more localized, enrich the data and validate it, and then pass it on to our, our partners in various marketplaces that you can see there on the right hand side of the screen. That's pretty much it for me and my presentation here. Um, I'm opening up to uh, VJ, I guess, if we've got some, some questions outstanding for the team. Um, it's been, been great talking to you. Oh, I think you're on mute there, VJ. Yes, I was on mute, thank you. We will uh, get to the questions after we go through the second speaker too. Thank you, James, for the great presentation. I really, we really appreciate it, thank you. Um, the second presentation we have is from Tom Cooper. Um, if you are coming to this conference, you will know Tom. He has been in this business and this area. He lives in Philadelphia. He attends this conference religiously. And I almost thought we got rid of him, when he uh, when he quit his last job, but he's back with this new company. So with that, uh, Tom Cooper is No Traffic's VP of Strategic Partnerships, whose former role have also included executive management, direct and channel sales, global team and partnership development, operations management and systems engineering. Cooper's previous experience includes position with Siemens, traffic technology services, rhythm engineering, Earthlink Municipal Networks and Motorola Corporation. Relevant experiences include subject matter expertise with adaptive traffic control systems, large scale terrestrial and wireless networks, ATMS platforms, connected automated vehicle applications and mission critical communication applications and networks. With that, Tom, take it away. Great, thanks so much for the introduction VJ and it's great to uh, see uh, existing friends and make new friends on, on the conference. And I definitely look forward to participating again physically next year. As I think I, I need to get my uh, screen sharing back. James, could you drop off there? I think you could just hit share screen. Tom. I think uh, James needs to stop. Oh. There we go. Oh, thank you. 
Thank you, James. So as uh, uh, James, uh, you really gave a great, um, great view of, uh, of a, the, the, the macro view for, for data. I'm gonna focus more micro on the intersection. Uh, so I'm Tom Cooper, I'm with No Traffic. We are the world's first fully autonomous end-to-end -end traffic management service platform. Uh, I'm not gonna focus so much on the product as the concepts, but I will have to talk about the process and, and the, the product throughout this. Uh, artificial intelligence, and there are a couple of distinct problems moving traffic that are very, very well suited by artificial intelligence. Uh, we are very fortunate uh, in living in this time because the technology from a silicon standpoint, also a software standpoint, is developed where it's actually very, very cost effective for many applications. And I'm, and I'm gonna talk about those applications over here very shortly. I'm gonna focus on two, signal timing and also robo user detection analytics behind it because there are two perennial challenges for moving traffic effectively. What I'd like to do first though is really set a context for what is artificial intelligence. It's become very fashionable to talk about any machine that takes an input and creates an output as being an artificial intelligence. And, and I maintain that there's, there's, there's some distinct differences uh, for those data scientists who may be participating, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, highly simplify some of these concepts, but think about deterministic versus non-deterministic. So non-deterministic, a uh, deterministic algorithm is something that's really not AI based. It's written by a human and essentially the outputs don't change. And a non-AI algorithm always gives the same out for a given input. So think about that. An artificial intelligence algorithm may not necessarily give the same output based upon its learning. So keep those thoughts in mind as we go through this. So an example of a deterministic type of system is the traffic signal controller. So a traffic signal controller obviously is based upon fixed timings that the observer goes out, takes counts, uh, takes them back, runs them through pass or synchro or some model to create timing plans. But essentially any input that's given gives the same output for this very simplistic example, obviously is two plus two generally equals four. So that's the type of logic and that's a deterministic algorithm sort of a system. And then kind of the next layer of, of intelligence behind intersection control devices is we call machine learning and traditional detection products. And, and I'm not uh, trying to impugn detection at all, video detection, but essentially those models were built upon taking inputs running them through different process stages and having feedback loops to come up with some sort of a determination. So instead of using a loop in the ground, which is a binary effect, you know, it's, there's either presence or not presence, I'm using the logic to decide do I have presence or not. So that's kind of another layer of awareness of the, the, the activities of this device. The difference between machine learning and, uh, and the, the deterministic algorithm is that there's a human somewhere in this process that defines the logic and creates the training behind this. Then we have this next generation now of artificial intelligence, which is called deep learning artificial intelligence algorithms that essentially the algorithms themselves write their own code. They create their own learnings. So you can, you can develop a higher level of output. So for an example, this happens to be captures of, of the sensors that we use in our system that has intersection awareness about vectors and competing vectors and potentially anonymous Act, uh, anomalous activities that lets the intelligence to determine has an accident happen. So another, another abstraction layer, very, very high level by taking inputs, learning, and, and being able to decide uh, and make inferences based upon the actions of the intersection. So what I'm talking about from, from this point onward are deep learning artificial intelligence algorithms behind all these specific functions. So let's put this in context. Artificial intelligence is transforming all aspects of our lives. If you look at flight, back in you know, the 40s and the 50s, to fly from you know, Philadelphia to Pittsburgh, it took three people sitting in that cockpit to make that plane fly and land there safely. Or today, you can, when the world opens up, get on the Airbus A350 in Newark, and it will land in Singapore nonstop. It will take itself off, it will fly there, and it will land. Agriculture. So artificial intelligence has been applied to crop yields and watering and fertilizer to give us just an amazing, amazing output so that we can start, we can feed 10x more people uh, per, per acre of land than we did even 20 years ago. And if you look at one area very specifically where major impacts are being made is medicine. So uh, you know, back in the day, it was a very invasive process to determine outputs and make diagnoses where we have systems now that can take multiple inputs using inferences and then come up with a very, very quick uh, determination of what's the best treat, treatment methodology. And literally, uh, at, let's say if a surgeon were sitting in James Eaton's uh, 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 place in uh, Stoke-on-Trent, could be doing surgery across the world with somebody here in, in the States. So the technology exists for that. So how does that compare to the traffic landscape, traffic control? 
So really the world of traffic control started by this uh, traffic control officer is being emulated in hardware. And this, this lowly electromechanical timer evolved into, which is today, still the electromechanical timer with electronic makeover, right? So essentially the traffic controllers of today function the same with these devices in the past where it's fixed timing plans and certainly there are capabilities of manipulating data, but essentially the fundamental construct is traffic management and traffic movements are based upon using these fixed timing constructs. The other area of major impact is also this detection realm, where if you're driving actions in, in at the intersection requires data inputs. So we have the, the venerable traffic loop, which is great. It's binary on or off, yes, presence or not. But when you start to start to advance services, like things like act, act, actions based upon classifications, they need higher, higher levels of, of functioning and logic to do that. And these, the some specific problems related to loops, just the basic maintenance and function of those a whole category of products that were developed to essentially emulate those loops. So again, not to impugn these, but there are some specific examples of, uh, and, and reasons why there are, there are some challenges that can be solved very, very, very well with artificial intelligence and traffic signal control is really one of the fundamentally last domains that can be uh, managed by that. So I'm not gonna uh, bore you with this whole treatise on traffic engineering, certainly your traffic engineers uh, on this call, but the traditional traffic management is based upon taking traffic counts and maybe actually be out in the field with a count board or looking at videos and putting it to a timing plan. And then it's eventually at some point in the future putting the traffic controllers and then actions happen at the intersection. And certainly I can use detection to, to create actions based upon presence or not. But the fundamental process still remains that this is this disconnected process of collecting data, generating timing plans, putting the controller sometime in the future. So these models work tremendously well when there's a lot of predictability. With this new variability and new, new origin destination patterns is we're able to, to see you know, uh, using data sets like Weijo and, and other providers, what's gonna happen next Tuesday? What's happened to origin destination? So a lot of the planning and the traditional models have, are, are gonna fall apart. So I just like to stop and, and thank traffic engineers because essentially these are the tools you've had that really haven't changed fundamentally and the whole the domain hasn't changed fundamentally in the past 100 years effectively by having to deal with the constraints of the traffic signal controller. So some of the perennial issues, those of you do timings, are creating coordination without starving side streets is, is a continual balance and fairly straightforward to develop timing plans if you're doing unidirectional coordination. But when you start getting more complex models, bidirectional coordination, particularly along the multi-jurisdictional corridors, who is suffering? Is it the local residents? that have to sacrifice time and, and have to take the delay for the transient populations. And those of you who do timings know this is, is a balancing act of, I wanna create progression with side street delay. Not impossible, but, but certainly challenging. When you start getting into very complex environments, just the math and the permutations behind timing becomes very, very challenging, if not impossible with variability. And then when the networks start getting very complex, complex interdependencies, and you look at some of those pictures that uh, James had up previously, these are real world ur urban environments with a lot of challenges. So if you have you know, multiple grids that have dependen dependencies upon inputs of, of highway volumes that vary considerably, or if you have constraints like rail crossings, think about all the timing plans it would take in order to deal with this type of traffic on a regular basis and also deal with changes in the future. And you see those models become extremely difficult, if not impossible to deal with. Then throw in things like emergency vehicle preemption, and then it just becomes uh, this mathematically impossible using the traditional constraints. So this is an area where artificial intelligence is extremely valuable and is very, very effective. So I'm just going to, I'm going to point to some of the devices that we use in our system. This gives you some, some idea of uh, how this process flow would work. So if you use a very intelligent sensor on, on the edge, which is able to use edge processing to first of all, uh, count, classify, and also get a high presence detection, I'm able to create actions based upon the type of objects are there, vehicles, uh, pedestrians, bicycles, or what have you. And a typical process flow would be collecting data with really, really intelligent sensors on the edge, driving them to an optimization engine that sits in the traffic cabinet. And this is our, kind of our universal connector to the world using deep learning artificial intelligence algorithms that are based upon simulation. I'm gonna come back to the simulation concept, concept here in a minute. So collecting data locally, using cloud data for platoon movements, but then using operator policies to drive decisions. And I'm gonna come back to that in a minute as well. 
And fundamentally, all the safety constraints obviously are programmed since the controllers said so immutable things about the amper times, all red times, and pedestrian crossings are not violated. By using a simulation based environment, the thousands of simulations per second, not only do I get continuous improvement of traffic flows, but I can also see if I want to make changes in the terms of priorities and policies, what the actual impact will be out in the street. And that's one area that's typically also been disconnected is creating a simulation. Those of you who've done that, created simulations, then we actually watch what happens on the street. Those two things could be very, very different. So essentially what you, we're using artificial intelligence, we've been able to create this abstraction layer of just creating policies using this autonomous traffic management platform to let the agencies decide. My overriding policy for a corridor could be progression, uh, northbound, southbound, eastbound, westbound, but then there could be very specific policies to an intersection where, for example, it might be pedestrian delay reduction or uh, some activities related to the actual uh, types of objects at the intersections themselves. Another area extremely well suited for solving problems with artificial intelligence is, is, is sensing and detection, an area that's it's been a perennial challenge for a lot of agencies. So by using multiple inputs of physics, let's say in our example, using radar and video with deep learning analytics, the, the sensors themselves, these type of sensors can learn their environment. So challenges are dealt with very, very effectively. And there are very distinct challenges and, and uh, for, for different areas, different climates and, and, and uh, different latitudes and what have you. But for example, fog, perennial issue for video detection and, and some thermal detection technologies and just things like condensation on lenses and shadowing, the bane of, of many detection platforms. But fundamentally what happens is if the systems are not effective at, at managing presence, you're potentially adding a safety issue by false negatives. So by using integrated uh, multiple sensory inputs and artificial intelligence, you get a very, very high level of cost, uh, accuracy and classification as well as presence itself. And yes, folks, winter is coming and, and we're gonna be seeing this here very shortly. Then you have conditions where traditional detect te detection technologies weren't even designed to manage things like bicyclists and scooters and classifying between those. So again, being able to get deep insights about the intersections can give you much higher level of performance. So in terms of detection, Legacy detection accuracies are due to single inputs and these static detection methodologies and algorithms. It could be also very, very maintenance intensive. So those of you who have to deal with detection, particularly video, it requires realignment, what have you. But using artificial intelligence, it can continuously uh, self-calibrate, doesn't require uh, care and feeding and maintenance, but also gives unparalleled accuracy. So the functions of the intersection become much more safe and also gives the ability to divine insights into what's actually going on. Is this situation anomaly? Is it an accident? Is it a work zone? Is it debris, et cetera? So artificial intelligence lets you do that. And then again, all the analytics around classifying user types so that you can get a deep sense of what's actually happened to the intersections themselves. And there's also something that we, we can do with artificial intelligence is making sure there's a fail safe mechanism that by fusing all the learnings, all the physics that I can get very close to 100% accuracy in, in uh, detecting presence. So essentially our platform, it's an app-based platform, uh, very, light, very light install with a sensor and a, a communications device called the app engine that goes into the traffic cabinet. It's a full end-to-end -end app solution with optimization, travel time, transit si signal priority, what have you, software defined. So future applications are to software downloads and fundamentally it's end-to-end -end solution. Uh, and cost obviously are dramatically reduced though, but just using software applications and uh, new applications are just simple software upgrades. So with that, I will uh, stop my uh, share and turn it back to uh, VJ. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, appreciate it. All right, with that, let's go on to the question and answer session. I have two questions and both for you, Lucky James. The first question is um, from Rachel. What are the metrics to determine ac accuracy? Yeah, good question. So metrics to determine accuracy. So WeJo uh, receives a, a, a data point, as I mentioned. Each of those data points, um, if you would imagine, has um, an attributed lat long to those data points. So we have a, a precision from that lat long of six decimal places. So we can show you where, where that data point is. The accuracy comes from a few things, ultimately, the, the makeup of the vehicle. So if we think about uh, a car. Uh, your car has a palabaric aerial. Um, 
our data is captured from the LTE SIM that's built into the head unit of the, uh, of the vehicle. That is then transmitted uh, through a 4G, 5G cellular network to provide that, that long location, along with all the additional attributes that that data point has captured. The accuracy piece comes in, in terms of um, our, our, how accurate we are saying, and from our study and from our tests of uh, where the, uh, the precision, the lat long is, in relation to the car. Now we see that down to around three meters of accuracy. So if you imagine you drew a, a circle around around a car, you would see from the uh, the hood to the, I'm trying to think of my US terminologies here for the boots of the- uh, <laughs> Trunk. What we're looking for. The trunk, that's it, thank you. So from the hood to the trunk, um, you'd be able to draw around a, a circle around that. That roughly is around three meters, ultimately. Now we're saying that 95% of our data points will fit within that circle. 5% of our data points, if we looked at all the vehicles that we have out there, would fit outside that circle. But the reason for that is such things as our data is based off GPS and some similarity that you would expect from mobile data. So mobile data would have um, uh, urban canyoning effects. So if you take uh, uh, downtown Philadelphia, the high rise buildings that are there may affect the line of signal of the GPS to help that vehicle triangulate its location. Connected vehicle data has a bit of an advantage in terms of the overall uh, components that make that up is a much larger array to understand the location at that given time. The other point, the other factor is that we are a vehicle. So if you were to understand and look at all the, the connected vehicle data that we have, even if there was a, an element of float, say 10 meters rather than the three meters I described, you would still get an idea that that was a vehicle very, very close to a roadway. It's a more one-to-one -one picture of where, the, where a vehicle actually is. So hopefully that helps with that question. Thank you, that, that really helps. Um, uh, if you do have any follow-up questions, please do post it in the Q&A and we can answer that too. The second question again for you, uh, James is, in, in your presentation, one slide showed the movements of vehicle in Philadelphia. Is the personally information, information scrub like the VA number, information, owner, et cetera? Just curious if this information might be used by law enforcement in the future. That's a very, very good question. Um, so as I mentioned in my presentation, we, Joe, has a duty for data for good, and that is ultimately data for the protection of the individuals. So I'm going to take it back to the beginning of the, uh, actually the process of how the data is obtained to help explain this. So Rejo's data that it has access to is consent given by the owner of said vehicle. And all that consent management is handled by the OEM partners that Rejo works with. So if you imagine you purchased a new vehicle and you're signing on the dotted line for your new contract for your new vehicle that you're excited to get hold of, in that contract, it will say that we will uh, use your, your location data to understand uh, supporting traffic studies, congestion management, some of the use cases that I described earlier. There's a benefit in kind back to that customer. They have extra connectivity to their vehicle, et cetera. And ultimately their data is then provided to Ejo to support in our use cases. What gets passed through is a abbreviated VIN, which is a Ouijo term called the squish VIN. So we don't get the, if I took the example that James Eaton lives in Stoke-on-Trent, England, and the full VIN would be able to tell me my name, my address, the vehicle that I have, the make, model, and year, all that detail. A squish VIN will tell you the make, model, and year. So we have just enough information to provide some insight into that individual vehicle to say that um we could determine if it's an ev or a suv those kind of things or we can provide some extra demographic profiling of the individual user uh, when they come where is the origin what kind of vehicle is it what, what else could we know from various other use cases but we're not providing the individual so we're therefore not infringing on pii data thank you james i appreciate it thank you uh, this question is for tom Tom, how would you compare yourself to some of the other adaptive systems currently on the market? Yeah, that's a great question, question and I appreciate that. So the fundamental difference is our, our, we have a, we're a full end-to-end -end intersection app platform. So optimization, adaptive, you will, is just one, one, one fundamental piece of the architecture. 
So without going through a whole laundry list of features, it's a fully integrated system with edge-based sensors that classify uh, user types. The, essentially, all the actions are based upon policies that can also be tied to user types. So for example, I can say my policy at intersection is pedestrian delay reduction, and then everything automatically happens behind that. The other aspect of this too is new applications or just software. So it's, it's a fully software de, uh, defined platform. So integrated is integrated travel time support, connected and autonomous vehicle support, emergency vehicle preemption support, TSB support. Those are just applications. So kind of think about it as the iPhone for the intersection where I've got a, a single investment in hardware. The other aspect of this too, this is a managed service. So we've got a, a traffic management center. We monitor 24 seven, 365. And we, we, we do this as a service as opposed to you know, just a piece of hardware that goes out there and runs. Mm. So that's, that's the fundamental difference. Thank you. I don't have any more questions, but I do have a few questions for the speakers. Uh, can each of you talk about the security aspects of your solution? How do you manage the security? Let's go with uh, James and then you can go to Tom. James, how do you handle the security? Yeah, it's a good question. So for us in terms of security, as we mentioned, we house a lot of data that could be infringed on. Uh, if used incorrectly, it could be uh, PII identifiable information. So one of the things that we do in that is actually interesting in connection to one of the questions that we had from the, from the forum here was that one of the me measures that we have is we have a persistent vehicle identifier that we Joe, can use in house to identify a vehicle's movements from A to B. But we don't have one that would be in terms of a, uh, a persistent one that we can pass out the door. The other things in terms of that is we have a high level of um, InfoSec, information security team here at WeJo. So we have an ASME gold standard uh, in terms of uh, security. So as I mentioned, we have a lot of personal identifiable information. So we have to have a high level of, of data security on our side. A lot of our work is uh, sort of uh, cloud-based. So it has to be an encrypted access to our partners through our cloud connection. Uh, we have a, a third-party information security requirements uh, uh, legislation that we have our partners to agree to. So it's ultimately that we have to set a minimum requirement of data uh, security themselves in order to, to work with us at, as, at WeJo. As we mentioned, we, we work very closely with uh, the world's largest OEM manufacturers. We can't operate in the way that we can if we don't have high level of information security. Thank you, and Tom. Yeah, great question. Actually, the, uh, the chief technology officer, uh, his entire background was building IoT and, and security. So it's all about encryption, encryption, encryption at different layers. So fundamentally, you have to look at um, the uh, multi layers. So from the sensors, all the processing, essentially metadata that comes out, that's a fully encrypted path to the application engine in the cabinet, which is firewalled. Then it's firewalled to the cloud connection, all encrypted. And fundamentally, the interface to the traffic cabinet is detection. So it's SDLC or it's serial or it's an NTCIP. So essentially you have all these layers where you essentially can't get into the, the, the customer network, but a super important piece and every, every step along the process is encrypted. Okay, thank you. The second question I have for each of you is, you know, the technology is moving faster than what we could imagine. You know, the more slough, 18 months is not even applicable anymore. It's even growing at a faster rate. So with that, where do you see the technology that you each of you is dealing with going the next two years and how are you preparing for addressing those technologies? You know, if you want to answer two years or five years, I will leave it up to you, but where is it going and how are you working towards adhering to the technologies? So, excellent question. I guess I'll, in the, the flow we've been going, I'll go first there. So for Wejo, in terms of our technology, what we'll start to see is more and more vehicles become connected. So talked about the vehicles we have on our platform so far with uh, model year 2015 onwards but i believe in part of the uh, right to repair act and those pieces that we're seeing at the moment that it's a requirement for more and more vehicles to be connected and also a requirement for more and more of that data to be shareable so what we'll start to see is a broader and broader representation of the vehicles that we might see out there what that'll come with if the, uh, the uh, data is used in the same way is challenges in terms of the volume so we already have around 36 terabytes worth of data in the entire US uh, nationally. Uh, what that'll mean is, is there's ways and innovation to make a, uh, a more so succinct data set, a more succinct answer to our, our, our partners' questions will be required. Uh, 
maybe even some machine learning uh, algorithms to understand in similarity to some of the stuff that, that, that Tom's been talking about there. For Weijo in our future, uh, you know, we're talking about expanding our sensor array, expanding uh, the, the information that we can provide. So it talks about weather sensors. We all talk about the uh, air tire pressure any engine headlights or any engine warnings, et cetera, from the vehicle to allow us to diversify and to go into some other use cases as well. But ultimately what it might mean for us in the future is we all know the autonomous car is coming, right? We're building up slowly over time, more and more of a view of what the roadways would look like, a longer history in terms of day by day, hour by hour, what the vehicle movements look like. There's a future for Weijo in that in terms of supporting with those autonomous vehicle use cases and feeding that information in. Thank you, James and Tom. Yeah, and, and, and thanks, Rick, and thanks for the question. I think that's, there's a multi-layered answer to that. So a couple of things have happened. Uh, first of all, our world now is, is really accepted technology and software as a service. So our market as well in transportation is gravitated towards that from just a, a process standpoint for agencies, there's now a construct where we can look at things like instead of using uh, uh, CapEx to buy stuff, buy a box, now I can look at buying the technology because essentially they're looking for results. So I think that lends, so if we had been talking about this perhaps 15, 20 years ago, then that may have been a challenge, but even the Department of Defense going, is going to everything cloud-based. There's a reason for that because using a software-defined architecture to a very large extent future proofs you. Also being a service provider, if there are any fundamental changes in hardware, it's the service provider's responsibility to make sure that's put in place. So it's kind of a very different model than just an acquisition. I think some of the exciting things around the future though is this transition period between the connected vehicle and the non-connected vehicle and being able to use all of these technologies to benefit all the roadway users. So being able to take data from connected vehicles, which is which inherently all of our protocols are internally are connected vehicle based and, and really democratizing the whole connected vehicle space. So a pedestrian that's not instrumented can take advantage of pedestrian delay based upon, let's say maybe inputs from a phone, inputs from a connected vehicle, input from some third party uh, you know, data provider. And I think that's the exciting part of it. So I think when you get these to these software defined architectures, you're not locked into now, does this box that I've acquired, is it capable of doing this? And it kind of obviates all of that. So. It's really a future-proofed type of approach. Okay. Still, we have eight more minutes to go. I could keep going with my questions. If there are any questions in the audience, I can, I can, I could still take them. Uh, the next question is, you know, have you? I know you have deployed the solution for the clients. What are the challenges you encountered when you deploy the solution, and how did you come around the challenges? You know, you could talk about major one or two challenges that you had with the client when you implement the solution. Tom, can you, can you answer that first and then we could go to James? So as far as uh, actual implementation, it's, it's, been, it's been pretty anticlimactic. So the traditional things where, because we're very fortunate, we're a very light overlay to intersections. So I don't require a lot of readiness. Essentially what I need is a mounting location and power and space in a cabinet. So the traditional things, and there are some installation things like positioning sensors, what's the best vantage point to get and um, really just, expanding the, the thought process of the agencies and the data that's available because a lot of agencies don't even have access to data to, to make assessments about, is my regime for managing traffic effective? So just getting them to use tools and being aware of all everything that's in, in the system. Another part of it too is if you look at platforms that are so broad in their capabilities, sometimes it's a little overwhelming for an agency that says, look, I just want really good detection now. This fixes some of my problems. So really it, look, should, looking at the individual individual benefits and and, and um, making sure they have a clear path to using a lot of different functions to get your know, benefit in traffic operations. Thank you. How about you, James? I think it's, I think it's, again, it's a good question. Uh, from our perspective, obviously there's no, there's no hard, hardware issues whatsoever. It's all, um, we have a contract with ROEMs, the data flows in, the data can flow out. So there's no issues there. In terms of any setup. Some of the challenges might come in from our perspective in terms of uh, the volume of data that we have. I touched upon this in my previous response is a high volume of throughput of data. Uh, the, the, the 36 terabytes worth of data a, a month banked uh, from 10 million vehicles now we're due to ramp to uh, 20, 25 million vehicles in the next two years. 
So you can see how that would ramp. And obviously then we have a global coverage coming soon as well. So some of the challenges in that is having so much data and what to do with it. So our innovations then in terms of, of aggregated data sources, in terms of providing platforms as a service, that kind of thing to support some of our customers that may not necessarily be able to ingest the high volumes of data that we handle. That's a core part of Weijo really in terms of taking that data and making use of it for, for organizations that might not be able to have that infrastructure in the, in the cloud and the hardware of that nature to, to take it. Thank you. We still have five more minutes, guys, and I, I'm going to ask one last question, and then you know we could uh, we could end the presentation. Which is, are you guys collecting more information than you would actually need? And do you, if so, do you see any um, use for the additional information that you could see that client could clients could use that for? Does the question make sense? Yeah, I think so. I think I could. I, I think I can answer that in terms of the the data that we don't need. So in terms of Weijo, again, we have this uh, data policy is data for good. So inherently with our cooperation and conversations with our, our OEM partners, the data has to have a certain field of use and has to have a certain reason to go to our customer. So inherently there is no real uh, data waste. In fact, what we're looking at now is we're storing data month on month, week to week, year on year, et cetera, back in time. So we can start to provide interest and insight into uh, vehicle volumes in any given location pre-COVID. As I mentioned earlier on, we have data back to uh, May 2019 and our movement data of February 2018 and our event data. So you can start to see a historic view, you can start to model off more and more data uh, back in time. So many of our customers are US based, they may ask for a, uh, a certain location. We never send them more data than is actually required. So they often ask for a custom geo of some description. So ultimately, no data is wasted, it's all stored. And at the moment, we're a pretty good partner with Amazon Web Services for how much data we have. So um, that gives you an idea there, so. Anything from you, Tom? Yeah, I would say there's there's no data that's not invaluable, but for, for operations is actually a very, very small sliver of what's available. So just some, some examples, the sensors that process at the edge captures all the metadata about vectors and, and, and precise positioning. So I can do things like, and I gave that example of the deep learning to say, I can give you alerts about accidents or debris in the roadway or, or work zones. So that may not necessarily be something that interested an agency who essentially wants to uh, create a good coordination model or have better detection, but all of those things are available. So it, it, it's there and we make the, the um, and so we're also finding a lot of uh, areas where police departments are interested in getting data about accidents to work with traffic departments to define countermeasures and also be able to respond and get through investigations faster. So, so many different sources of data that could be very effective for a lot of stakeholders outside the traditional traffic engineering realm. Thank you. Hey, one last question. I, I'm sorry. I just realized that I had one question more to James than Tom. So I want to make it even so that I'm not partial to any of the speakers. I got to give one to you, Tom. <laughs> this is a question from Fernando. It's in the question and answer, uh, answer screen. Do you currently have any no traffic deployments in Pennsylvania or are there any plans for a test deployment in the near future? Hey, Fernando, great, great, great to, to be on be in a, a, a session with you. Uh, let's make that happen. So where, where we are is we, we are, we're based in, in Silicon Valley. We've got installations now with Caltrans in California and, and, and Southern California. We're very active in, in Arizona. And of course, I live here in Pennsylvania, so I need to get something to happen here. So it's just been just a matter of, of getting there, but I'd love to work with you if you have opportunities. Let's talk about those because I, th I think it's a very good fit. And you know, having worked in Pennsylvania and working on some projects, I think this is a pretty good solution to solve a lot of problems. All right, with that, thank you so much, Tom and James. We really, really appreciate your time. And James, a special thanks to you because we recognize that it's late in the evening because you are on the other side of the coast. So thank you so much. And thank you again, Tom and James. Appreciate your time and your presence here. Uh, looking forward to working with you more. Thank you. Have a very good day. Oh, and, and thank, thank you, you all for the participants to attendees. Thank you for your time too. Thank Take you care. Everyone. Thanks again. See you now. Bye -bye. Yep. Cheers. Bye.